Welcome to the Tom Nelson podcast. I have John Robson here today. And John, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? I'm the executive director of the Climate Discussion Nexus, which produces both newsletters and videos on the subject of climate. Uh, I'm actually a historian by training. And when the whole climate scare got started, the first thing I did was look at the past to see if what they were saying seemed to be justified. Uh, I have taught university. I work as a journalist. But these days, the main focus to me is, is the climate stuff, because it's such an important issue. Uh, it has such harmful policy implications, and the science behind it is just not what the activists and the politicians think it is. Okay. Uh, how long have you been involved in uh, in climate? Gosh, more years than I care to remember. It's got to be about a quarter century now. I remember it was in the late 90s when Canada's Prime Minister Jean Chrétien suddenly started uh, going on about climate deniers, which, of course, was a deliberate attempt to link people who are skeptical of this kind of alarmism to Holocaust deniers. And one of the things that struck me about it was, was obviously Jean Chrétien was a man who, if he had passed high school chemistry, he had long since forgotten everything he knew, but he had no real basis in the facts or the logic around global warming to be taking this exceptionally uh, hostile and aggressive stand. And this just naturally led me to start researching it and writing about it and saying, well, hold on, the, these people talk with a degree of certainty about what they say is happening that is not justified either by what really is happening or by anything that they know about the subject. And this had a familiar feel. It was not my first rodeo, as they say, in terms of a certain kind of public policy panic. And I, so I started looking into the science behind it and the evidence, and I found that it was just very, very wrong. Okay. Uh, I found your documentary on YouTube, uh, The Environment, A True Story. And it looks like you've interviewed a lot of uh, luminaries or uh, like Will Happer, et cetera. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. if you're going to talk yeah. about something, I've often thought it was a good idea to know something about it first. And and as I say, there is this theory that uh, atmospheric CO2 is what determines the temperature on the planet. And so the first thing you ask yourself is not, well, could someone make a computer model that would tend to say that if they told it to? It's to look at the past history of the Earth and say, well, in the past, have atmospheric CO2 and temperature tended to correlate? If atmospheric CO2 goes up, does temperature rise and vice versa? And Will Happer was very generous with his time. We distinguished uh, atmospheric physicist and so on. And we talked a good deal about this question. How, how do we know or how do we think we know what the temperature was and what atmospheric CO2 was like millions of years in the past? And what evidence is there that CO2 is, in the classic phrase, the control knob on the planetary thermostat? And, and again, it's uh, I thought this was very fishy, but it was helpful to dive into it with somebody who had that much detailed background to make sure that I wasn't missing something. Um, and Happer, of course, is uh, it was one of my favorite episodes when he was uh, briefly with the Trump administration. The New York Times, I think it was, wrote a story saying, oh, well, he's not a climate scientist. And I thought and I looked and it was written by people with degrees in English. And there's Happer, who is a, an atmospheric physicist. And I thought these people don't even know what disciplines are relevant to the question of how the climate works. And yet they speak with such indignant and condescending certainty, you know, brushing Will Happer aside. Well, you know, good luck with that. Okay. Uh, have you traveled around then to spend time with climate scientists throughout uh, the last 20 years? Or? I have to some extent. I have uh, family obligations that make travel a little bit difficult, but luckily in the era of the internet. Um, and also, I, for young people, it is possible to get these curious rectangular objects filled with paper called books, uh, and they uh, contain much useful information. I've never met Ian Plymer, but I've certainly read his book, um, Heaven and Earth. And so there's a great deal of readily available information. And again, I say, as, as a professional historian, people sometimes say, oh, well, you're not a climate scientist. And I say, you know, I'm trained in looking at the past to try and understand the present and predict the future. And I don't know what else you'd use to do it. And so right away, the problem is you could come up with a very clever theory for how CO2 drives temperature. But if the evidence is that it doesn't, your theory is not really very useful. And so you go back, for instance, you look at the medieval warm period, then you say to yourself, is this a phenomenon that can be accounted for by changes in atmospheric CO2 or the little ice age? Or even, I mean, just take the 20th century and you see the temperature goes up, then down, then up, and then it pauses. And this does not correlate with CO2. 
And you go back further, you go back to the Holocene climatic optimum and so on, and you see temperature going one way and CO2 going the other. And if you get back into the you know millions of years, again, the, the evidence just isn't there to support the contention. So it's mathematically clever, sure, but you know, as John von Neumann said, if you give me four parameters, I can give you an elephant. And if you give me five, I can wiggle its trunk. Um, you can make mathematical models appear to confirm your preconceptions. But what you've basically done is you've pro you programmed in your preconceptions. And, and an infamous example of this is Michael Mann getting rid of the medieval warm period because it what I mean, he understood fairly well it can't be allowed to exist because it puts paid to this whole CO2 theory. But, um, you know, he's never really told us how he did it. But we have all this evidence in the Viking voyages and so on. And, and then people say, oh, yeah, sure, but it was just in Europe. But then we have evidence that it existed in Tibet, you know, and it existed down in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, it, it's si simply absurd to maintain that CO2 has driven temperature in the past, at which point your theory that it suddenly started doing it, I don't know, around the time Richard Nixon was reelected, that it, without giving us any any real idea of why would the laws of, sort of planetary physics change in the latter part of the 20th century it, it's just it doesn't pass the smell test uh, do you think yeah you have an understanding of what caused the medieval warm period no i mean that that is part of the the thing early on i was actually um when i was in high school i i was studied mathematics intensively and then when i went on to university i wanted to understand um human affairs and so on it's very interesting public policy and i had this intuition that it's not going to yield to mathematical modeling and of course, later on, chaos theory came along and rather patted me on the back and said, yes, you're right. The things we most want to know about are not really uh, solvable using linear algebra because they're, they're sensitively dependent on initial conditions. And this means, though, there are patterns that we can see in the Earth's climate, including the cyclical warming and cooling that's been going on during the Holocene. The idea that you can put them all into a matrix and normalize it and have it come out with that lovely row of ones and then you've solved it. Uh, I mean, and, and don't get me wrong, linear algebra has been responsible for enormous advances in human knowledge and well-being in the last 500 years, but it has limits and climate is one of them. It looks as though the Holocene is cycling toward its end, that the glaciers will come back as they have done uh, many times in the last two and a half million years, but I can't tell you exactly when. I can't, I don't think that I know when the current upswing from the Little Ice Age is going to end. But by the same token, I mean, the alarmists talk as though they know the temperature would have just stayed right where it was from the time that Prince Albert died if it weren't for human CO2. And so they have this null hypothesis where temperature does not change. And they say, so everything that's happened basically was human beings. But I say, but if you look back further, uh, you see that temperature has changed constantly. So your your theory is just weird. And and again, people are pe when people say, well, what happens if all the ice melts? And I agree, we're we're in a heap of trouble, right? Or we're in a slush of trouble. Uh, but I I actually don't know if it's going to happen, and I don't pretend to. It's not me saying, well, they have a model that says this will happen, but that's wrong because that will happen. It is not clear what will happen. I mean, again, you look back to the beginning of the Holocene, right? The, you get this, the, the glaciers are in retreat, temperatures are rising dr with dramatic suddenness, you know, and then suddenly you get this younger, driest cooling. And I don't know why it happened, and neither do they, which means none of us can be really sure that it's not going to happen again, you know, and it could happen next week, or it could happen next century, it could happen in a millennium, or it could not happen. Uh, and this is disquieting. I don't deny, I would like to know, there's all kinds of things I'd love to know that I just don't, uh, from my personal life on through my professional life to public policy. But if you don't know, you don't know, and you need to have the humility to say, since we don't know what the temperature is going to do, let's make sure that we are as economically and socially resilient as possible. So if nature throws a curveball, as it has done on a great many previous occasions, we are uh, we are in a position to hit the thing instead of just looking stupid there at the plate. So do you think nobody really knows then if it's going to be warmer or cooler in 2050 or 2100 or they have lots of people have ideas, but we're just going to have to wait and find out, aren't we? I think that yeah. by and large, that is true. Again, if, if you look at the, the temperature cycles in the Holocene, you see the climatic um, optimum was, was the warmest it's been since the glaciers retreated. And the Minoan warm period seems to have been warmer than the Roman warm period. It seems to have been warmer than the medieval warm period, which appears to have been warmer than this one. So if I had to place a bet, I'd say we've peaked and it's going to start going down. 
But again, it depends on all kinds of things, for instance, ocean currents, enormously complicated things, and again, nonlinear. And when you've got three or four nonlinear processes interacting, including what the sun does, Mr. Sun is extremely important. Big hot yellow thing in sky affects temperature. Um, but the patterns of sunspots and solar cycles, though there's this haunting semi-regularity to them, you cannot put it into a computer and say, we will have this many sunspots in the next cycle. So uh nobody really does know and what's more it's not because the computers aren't fast enough uh it's because there is no set of equations that could capture the complexity of reality other than you know another earth too you'd have to actually build a computer that was like uh you know deep thought suggested you build another earth and it'll you could run the test again but it's just it, it's so complicated and you know, Galileo had that famous line about mathematics being the language in which the universe is written. And that's been the dominant paradigm for 500 years. And as I say, with enormous success, it's why jet airplanes fly and uh, why uh, why computers work, all kinds of things that we like, except when they crash. Um, and so we're tempted to say, well, it can solve everything. Like, like these models of the economy that say, well, it's going to grow 2.6% next year unless it doesn't. Uh, and these epidemiological models, which said everybody's going to die unless many people survive. And, and you quickly realize that it's what's driving those models is the programmer's assumptions. And you change those assumptions and you'll get it to tell you what you want. If you have some free market institute modeling the economy, they'll tell you high taxes, depress employment. Then you get some union outfit modeling the economy and they say high taxes, stimulate employment. And it's not because the computers don't work. It's because the computers do exactly what they're told to do. Um, but even the, the economy is transcomputable. I mean, Soviet planning was a classic example. They kept thinking a better computer will do it for us. Um, but the number of interactions between firms and consumers and the, the number of choices a person makes in the course of a day, not always as we experience personally, um, rational, at least in retrospect, you, you cannot put that into a computer. And then you think about, you know, the, the, the planet, they can't, can't even do clouds. Uh, so they just leave them out. They don't do water vapor because it's too hard. Well, that's no way to model a climate unless what you want is to be able to say, oh, the computer says we need higher taxes. Yeah, but if you tell the computer to say that, it will say it. Uh, do you have any sense as to how much anthropogenic global warming we could get if we burned all the fossil fuel we could find? Uh, how much warmer could we make the earth, other things being equal? Any idea? None, uh, because CO2 doesn't drive temperature. I mean, I'm not saying that it's not a greenhouse gas. Every now and again, we get notes from people who sort of refuted the whole uh, laws of physics, and we politely delete those. But um, there are several things that we'll hear. One of them, of course, is just the diminishing returns, right? It's a logarithmic scale. And uh, the more CO2 you put out, the less impact each new molecule has. Um, there's also, so there's, and Will Happer, among others, argues the atmosphere is essentially saturated. But I come back to this point, and again, there's, this has been studied by a lot of people, and they've put together a lot of time series and reconstructions. CO2 just doesn't drive temperature. So increasing CO2 won't make it start. I mean, Al Gore famously in um, An Inconvenient Truth does that chart going back into the last seven or 800,000 years, and he says, oh, look at the fit. Isn't that revealing? And he's very sm he smirks about this, like it's continental drift. But what he doesn't observe and i'm not saying he was lying but he what he completely missed is that the temperature moves first and with about 800 year lag co2 responds i mean it's not impossible by the way that the increase in co2 recently is the 800 year lag response to the medieval warm period um but it's just one of those things that if if co2 doesn't make the planet warmer putting out more co2 isn't going to cause it to start making the planet warmer uh, so we we really we have no reason to worry about what human beings are doing. And you remind me of another thing, which I've always found odd about the alarmist position, which is that they they love nature, right? And right, and appropriately, so do I. And and they're all very impressed by how harmonious it is and how they have this carbon cycle where it's given off and absorbed and isn't Gaia splendid. But then they say, ah, but human CO2 is not absorbed because human CO2 tastes bad or something. It's 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 the processed cheese of CO2. And so they say all the natural CO2 is absorbed, but half the human CO2 is not. And that's why atmospheric CO2 is rising. But this is nonsense. If you have, uh, uh, you add together natural and human CO2 and you have this total amount that's put out and then 95% of it is absorbed, say, and 5% is not, or 98 and two, 
then the only logical assumption is that 95 or 98 percent of the natural and the man-made CO2 are being absorbed and the residual five or two percent is not. And the question is, why is the biosphere not absorbing all the CO2 that is out there? Um, and and to, to insist that, oh, it's absorbing all the natural CO2. Natural CO2 is fresh and sweet smelling and good for plants. But human CO2 is pollution and we're choking on it. Uh, again, it, it's it's such preposterously bad high school chemistry. Like I have to bring up John Kerry back when he was U.S. Secretary of State. He gave this speech in Jakarta when he talked about greenhouse gases and he said, try to imagine a blanket, maybe half an inch thick, way up at the top of the atmosphere. And I, in my documentary, I run a picture of a little pine sapling um, at our cottage and say, how did John Kerry think this thing was getting CO2 if it's all up at the top of the sky? How, how he could say something that ignorant and not have even the alarmists say, look, the problem is real. We understand the science, but that was completely blow on the head silly. Um, they, but they didn't call him on it. And that's, you know, bad intellectual hygiene. But that's the sort of thing people say, because they, they say we're following the science. And I'm, you know, it, it's just like I, I want to ask them what what is what's a molecule? What's a mole? You know what? Just very, very basic stuff that they just what I once got to ask a leading Canadian environmentalist what nonlinear meant. And after fumbling around, she finally uh, guessed that it meant geometric that it was one of these progressions that shot upward. And I thought, no, we've been having an argument where people like me are saying, you can't model this because it's nonlinear. And she's saying, oh, yes, we can. And Al Gore gets it wrong, too, uh, in an in inconvenient truth. That you, you don't understand the basic terminology. And instead of humility, you come out and you bully people. You insult them. You immediately substitute abuse for argument when challenged. And the idea that we would let such an approach prevail in public policy is one that I think would be very, very ill-advised. Uh, before I forget that, you mentioned that crazy quote by John Kerry. Have you heard the crazy one from John Holdren when he said that we might lose the summer Arctic sea ice? If that happens, we'll probably lose the winter Arctic sea ice too. Uh, that's not a direct quote, but he was suggesting that we won't have any, uh, any ice at all in the Arctic, even in the middle of the winter. That seems uh, like one of the more crazier things I've heard. Yeah, ex ex until you realize that there's a whole chorus of people saying it again, including Al Gore. And in one of our videos where we, we look at the doomsday predictions and one is we look at the way that one kept getting updated. You know, it's like these prophets. So, you know, the, the world will end. The second coming is going to be on Tuesday. And when the second coming is on Tuesday, they say, yeah, OK, we muffed the math. It's next Wednesday. And then it's OK. It's the year after next. And at some point you have to say, no, there's there's something wrong with your assumptions because you know the Arctic sea ice is, in fact, rebounding. And again, I know that some people feel that the alarmists are faking it for some sinister purpose because they do things like they say, oh, you know, well, the Arctic sea ice is at its lowest extent since satellite records began, without telling you that the satellite records coincidentally began at a peak in the ice cycle in the very late 1970s, back when Leonard Nimoy was warning us of the coming ice age. We know that ice had been accumulating in the Arctic since the 40s, and then uh, in the late 70s, yes, it started to melt again. But we also know that it had melted around the turn of the last century, and then it accumulated, melted again, accumulated. So any rational person would say it's cycling, and then ask, has something happened to the cycle? But instead, they just did this sort of linear thing. Well, it's been going down from 79 into the 90s, so I guess it's all going to melt, and boo-hoo, we're, we're to blame. And then it starts accumulating again. And when you point this out, they're very likely to uh, start attacking your characters, saying, oh, you're funded by oil companies. And so, well, good, tell them to send the check. Uh, but but it's very, very sloppy statistical work. And then again, people will say, oh, they must be deliberately lying. But the answer is no. They're really convinced that this is happening and they're bad at statistics. Uh, and they're so fired up about it that they get careless. Uh, and this is a very common thing for human beings to do. Again, as a historian who studies ideas, I can assure you that a great many people have thought a great many very silly things over time and persisted in thinking of them, even when there's a lot of evidence that it's not working out. Uh, I, I mean, you look at the career of tyrants and the way in which they persist in policy blunders. And I, I mean, I remember running into this a lot. I studied the Soviet Union and people would say, oh, Stalin, he wasn't a communist. Uh, he wanted power. He was just pretending to be a communist. 
And you look, he wrote a manifesto in 1924, Foundations of Leninism, saying exactly what he would do if he had power, and then he did it all. Uh, and people said, oh, that proves how clever he was. It's, no, it proves he was a communist. I mean, it's like saying Hitler wasn't really a Nazi. He just pretended to be so that he could launch a genocide and a war. Um, he, no, he was very sincere. And uh, Louis XIV thought he was governing France well. He really did. Uh, all kinds of people and all kinds of movements uh, are, are based on ideas that are plausible but wrong. And climate alarmism is like that. And people get so fired up that they just are willing to, if the data series don't work out right, like U.S. land temperatures, they'll adjust them because they, not because they're liars, but because they know for sure that there must be something wrong with the numbers because they don't say what we think. Um, and, and again, you get that with the Arctic ice, the fact that it, it was at a cyclical high in the late 70s should induce real caution in interpreting the melting. Or with the glaciers, there's another classic example. You say, oh, the glaciers are melting, the glaciers are melting. And I went to Glacier National Park, not in Montana, but in Alaska, um, back uh, about 10 years ago. And they gave us this lovely brochure about how climate change was destroying the glaciers. And then they had these maps showing the glaciers sticking out into the Pacific Ocean around 1700, and then retreating precipitously so that by 1900, they were, you know, most of the way up the fjords, and they've just done a little more melting since, which proves not that humans are melting them, but that we're not, because they started melting in 1700, and they melted dramatically for centuries. Um, but people would, if they were in some sort of conspiracy, they wouldn't show you that map, they'd hide it, they'd go, darn, this gives it away. And instead, they hand it to you cheerfully and say, see, it proves man's doing it. Just as an aside here, I went to the Glacier National Park in Montana in the fall of 2021, and they still had a sign up at the headquarters saying that experts say that the glaciers are going to be gone by 2020. It was still up. <laughs> <laughs> so pretty embarrassing. Yeah, and yet they don't embarrass easy, as Mick Jagger once said of his fellow rock stars. Uh, your, uh, your Climate Discussion Nexus YouTube channel looks like it's really thriving, tons of comments and views and stuff. Is that something you enjoy doing? Oh, it's been it's been a great experience. I have terrific colleagues, some of whom I have to say uh, work anonymously for fear of professional and even personal repercussions, which is a sorry commentary on the state of the debate. And it's interesting because we started out to do a newsletter and we thought we would do occasional videos, but the real the real product was going to be this newsletter. And we discovered that what people really liked was the videos. And I have to tell you, it, it's an interesting story. People say, how do you succeed online? It's like beats me. It's nonlinear. For the first year, I think we had something like 17,000 views. And then suddenly somebody shared it. Somebody discovered it. I, I still don't know what happened. And we got shot up to a million views. And ever since then, it's gone in these irregular waves. Um, but more and more, we have now had uh, 7.3 million views total on our videos. One video alone which is on the 97% myth, has had over a million views because that's one of the strongest claims in the alarmist's uh, arsenal. And so it's really important to know what's wrong with it. And so we put these things out and I've I've never met a camera that I didn't like, to be honest, uh, you may be guessed. And But we found that people value this. And since they like the videos that we, we you reinforce success, we started doing videos based on the newsletter uh, that get way more views than the newsletter does, to be honest. And... Um, because what we're doing, there's lots of people out there who, who think there's something fishy about this, but they're busy with their jobs and their lives and their families. And they so they're easily intimidated in debate. And we try to give them the facts and the ideas that they need so that they can get into the debate and not get steamrolled and not blow up either, because that really generally doesn't help. But just to use humor and logic and show the weaknesses in the in the argument. And when you put out a video and you discover that thousands of people are watching it and going, oh, this is what I needed, that's a really nice feeling. Now, of course, I have to say, we need people to make monthly pledges to support us because uh, you know we, we do have to uh, pay for the production of videos, we have to buy groceries, all these kinds of things. And people don't like fundraising pitches, but the thing is, if we can get a lot of people to give us three or four or five dollars a month, then we can continue to do this. People say, oh, you get these huge checks from the oil companies. And again, I'm like, well, if you know them so well, remind them because they're they're behind. I'm not against getting money from fossil fuel companies because I don't think they're destroying the planet. But it's really up to the ordinary people, the average viewers, the ones who look at this and say, gee, I wish I could get my brother-in-law to watch that, uh, to step up with these small pledges that add up to a popular movement, right? The government 
the other thing that's funny, people say the deniers have all the money. And then you look at the billions and billions that governments pump into climate alarmism. Uh, and here we are asking for $3 a month. But, you know, to be quite blunt, I know they've got it, right? That's one cup of coffee. I know they've got it. And uh, I really, really encourage people to make that pledge and help us to continue to do this because we are reaching this audience. We're getting out ideas that are not part of the mainstream. The press doesn't print them. I've been uh, you know, I used to do a lot of radio in Ottawa, but I don't get invitations anymore because I think basically climate deniers aren't allowed. Um, the main media outlets are all in on this. There's this academia is largely government funded. We have an alternate voice. And if people value it again, they need to they need to put their money where our mouths are. OK, and a good way to do that is to go to climate discussion nexus to the donate tab. Right. Is that the. Absolutely. And we have all kinds of ways you can do it. Um, there's a number of different platforms, credit cards, PayPal. If you're not steamed with PayPal, um, you can send us a check. There's, you know, in, in Canada, you can do the bank e-transfers, though, unfortunately, not internationally. We do try to make it easy. But I would also say, you know, we're a small outfit. People seem to think there's dozens of us. There certainly are not. So every now and again, it takes us a, a day or two to answer people's inquiries. But we are... Uh, we really are very keen to have people support and also, you know, to share the material with others, just to pass it on to people and say, hey, give this a look. This might help you uh, in, in the debates you get into or it might change your mind. There might be something here you haven't thought of. And we do try to do it with a certain amount of good humor, not to say that we don't uh, also employ a fair bit of sarcasm because ridicule is an important weapon in, in debate. But um, we really think that we've got the right side of the argument and we want to we want to do it with a smile because life is too short to be grumpy all the time. Absolutely. I do think skeptics could do a better job of promoting each other's work because I could try to go and replicate your, all your entire body of work, or I could point more people to what you've already done. Uh, I like doing that second that second one. So yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, and I'll, I'll mention, by the way, remember Jordan Peterson, who yeah. by some strange coincidence, I met Jordan Peterson right before he became enormously famous, right? He was, okay. uh, he, he was just about to become Jordan Peterson at this point, at least in the public mind. And and had had dinner with him and a discussion of what was going on. And then, you know, I, I started to support him. And I remember looking at that point, the, the numbers were still uh, public. He was getting over $50,000 a month, but he was getting it from 8,000 or so people. So the average pledge was just $7. And, you know, I still support Jordan Peterson, even though he is now um, probably wealthier than I am by a order of magnitude that you would have to be a mathematician to express clearly but i agree with you and we have to help and reinforce one another and not you know try to say well i'm the only one out there who's any good or gee if i point people to tom nelson they'll desert me for him it doesn't work that way uh you cast your bread on the waters and you um and sometimes people say the conservatives or you know in this case climate skeptics we all we, we ought to get more organized like they are on the other side but you know, we're independent minded people. And I think it's very valuable to have us working at it from different angles and in different kinds of ways. Um, there's all kinds of things that are going on out there. Other people are doing just terrific work. Um, Anthony Watts, obviously, is being a case in point. And um, I don't know his name escapes me, though. Uh, Tony I, Heller. He's, yeah, Tony Heller. Yes. Because one of the things he's terrific at is getting into the archives and finding this old material, whether it's the temperature series or the news articles. And so we don't need to do that. We just have to say, hey, look what Tony Heller did. Now, again, he's one of those who tends to treat it as though it's a hoax. And on that one, I'll take issue with him because we, uh, again, we conservatives tend to uh, argue with one another if we think we're wrong. We don't all have the same sort of dogmatic catechism. Uh, but yeah, he, again, he's, he's doing work that there's no need for me to replicate and really no way for me to replicate it. So uh, I do think, yeah, we should we should at least retweet one another. And I'm again, I'm grateful for being on your show because I hope that people will find our material, find it useful and send us money. Um, have you done many live debates either in person or over the internet with uh, with climate alarmists? I haven't. One one reason being that I'm uh, stretched to the limit with what we are doing, but also because they don't like to uh, debate and argue. They have uh, they think they have sort of cleared the stage of all dissenting views. Years ago, I did an appearance with David Suzuki, who's world famous in Canada as an environmentalist. And um, you know, I, I I am an environmentalist. One of the great moments in, in the discussion, he admitted that his children didn't think they should have a television at the cottage. And I said, oh, I grew up at a cottage with electricity. So uh, that trumped his ace there. But I, I, but I did take issue with some things he was saying. And somebody in the audience got him and said, how dare you criticize David Suzuki? 
And I said, well, because we're here to have a discussion. And I think he's wrong on this point. But they really were, it was as though I'd stood up in church and told the priest to get rid of that silly old bread. They really were indignant. Um, but, it, you know, I, I remember at one point I wanted to check a, a tweet by, I think it was Catherine Hayhoe, uh, just to use in the newsletter. And I discovered that she had blocked me. And it wasn't because I'd been sending her rude notes or retweeting her stuff with abusive comments. I had not, in fact, communicated with her at all. She just preemptively blocked me. And I thought that is a that's a remarkable attitude for someone to have, especially one who goes on at some considerable length about her own virtue. I would happily debate them. And in fact, when I you talked about my documentary that I did in, in 2017, just before the climate discussion nexus got started, and I started out at, at the old family cottage talking about my love of the environment because I thought. No one's going to listen to me if they think I don't care if we burn up the planet, at least, you know, none of the people that I'm trying to, to change their minds. And then I said, OK, here's what I think the alarmist argument is. I think it has three key tenets and I'm going to try and show you that they're all wrong. So I didn't try and crush their argument or ignore it. That's that's not an effective way of arguing, because. If you don't address the other side's arguments, people will think either that you can't address them, so you must be wrong, um, or else you're too ignorant to know what they are. So I tried to put it fairly, even when they wouldn't come on the stage to say, okay, here's this. I'm not going to give you a straw man. I'm going to say, we, you know, they think that we are undergoing unprecedented changes in the environment, that these portend disaster have not changed, and that they are caused by human activity. And I think that's a very fair-minded summary. And then I went after the, the three propositions at, at some length. I tried to keep the documentary under two hours and failed. Uh, but but again, I, I would happily debate these people, and I would really love to have a civilized debate where nobody called anybody a denier or accused them of having funding from evil sources or uh, of being a total blockhead. I'm amazed, too. Uh, we get these comments on social media where someone says, well, you obviously don't understand the science. And I say to them, "That's you don't start, you're an idiot, because you start by saying, I think there's a mistake here. You know, you, you debate the substance of it. But so often people just think the first thing to do is to demolish your opponent as a human being, and then you can leave their argument in the ruins of their character. But it doesn't work that way. Did you happen to see it? There was a maybe a four hour debate on the Lex Friedman podcast between Bjorn Lomborg and Andrew Revkin. Uh, I thought that was kind of amazing. I don't think that Bjorn Lomborg is the person I would choose to represent skeptics in a debate like that. But did you see it? Well, he is and he isn't because Lomborg was an alarmist and he still has this, we have a problem, but, and then he proceeds to uh, take issue with virtually everything the alarmist hardcore are saying. And of course, to some extent, that's very effective in reaching people who are themselves alarmists because they don't immediately write him off as one of those deniers. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, it, it's a slippery slope. You start by questioning a few of the claims and then you start questioning whether there's really a disaster. And then suddenly you're wondering if there's man-made warming at all. So, you know, I give Bjorn Lomborg about three years uh, before he uh, gets firmly into the camp of people who think the whole thing was was a strange mistake. Uh, it's like watching Michael Schellenberger yes. and his, uh, his rapid exit from the left. But it's it's a funny thing about, about left-wing thinking that, I mean, the old line, if you're not a socialist at 20, you have no heart. And if you are at 50, you have no head. Uh, that that you, you start with one or two taboos and you think it's safe to do that. And you could still be a leftist and a progressive and so on. And then you, when you see how they react to being challenged, you get more and more uncomfortable with the whole package, including its this thing that Thomas Sowell analyzed in A Conflict of Vision, so a book that had a huge impact on me when I was in grad school, that people on the right, loosely speaking, he calls it the constrained vision, think in terms of practical methods. Will it work or won't it? And people on the left or the unconstrained think in terms of motives. Are your motives pure or are they not? And if you're inside that bubble, all you see outside is enemies plotting. And once you get outside it on something for whatever reason, that whole way of regarding the world as a place where your opponents are motivated by conscious malice starts to be a bit sick making. You really start thinking, wow, that is that's actually an intolerant attitude toward the world. I mean, I, I worked at a free market think tank years ago. And when we said, gee, I don't think this will really help the poor, people would say, oh, you want them to be poor. And I, was, I thought not only is that a sort of 
dim thing to say, but it's kind of mean thing to say. Um, you don't know me. I might be really nice. How how could you be sure? Because I say the minimum wage will tend to shut people out of that vital first job that I actually would like to see them face down in the gutter. Um, and, and again, you get this with the climate thing. It's one reason I tell climate skeptics don't think climate alarmism is a hoax is because climate alarmism is itself a conspiracy theory that most alarmists insist that people like you and me actually know they're right, but we are being funded by the oil companies to burn up the planet that we're standing on, uh, which if true would make us incredibly stupid and also very, very nasty. Uh, but it, it's a kind of a weak-minded excuse. It's like, no, here's a person who is neither you know, completely ignorant nor uh, conspicuously insane or evil who doesn't agree with you. And, and I, I often quote John Stuart Mill here, um, that he who knows only his own side of the case knows but little of that. Even if you're right, if you don't understand why someone disagrees with you, you don't understand your own argument properly. So the, the alarmist should welcome the skeptical critique and take it on and say, okay, well, you say this about CO2 and temperature, but in fact, I can show you that here's what's driving it at a deep level and leading you to make this superficial error. They should they should want to know what's wrong. It's like if you're in the intelligence business, you know, and what you really want is a B team that critiques your conclusions so that you make sure there isn't some giant hole. Um, you know, I sports teams play scrimmages within the, within the team to, you know, make sure there aren't gaps in their offensive or defensive abilities, see if their goalie's any good. Uh, and but the but the alarmists have this very different mentality, and so as I say, I think people like Bjorn Lomborg once once they get out of the tent, they pretty quickly realize the air in there didn't smell so good actually. And how do you think uh, we're doing as skeptics? Do you think uh, you've been watching this for decades now? Do you think we're making progress, and that this is not the, the hysteria is not going to last another thirty years, or what do you see happening? Well, I think we are making progress. I mean, don't forget that that error is a, a renewable resource. I mean, I spent my early public policy career fighting people who thought the Soviet Union wasn't the threat to world peace Ronald Reagan was. And when that when that position collapsed, they moved on to a new one without a whole lot of embarrassment. But I think one of the things that's cornering the alarmists is that they've promised us an apocalypse. It's like these religious uh, the second coming will be next Tuesday. I mean, outside my window right now, that we've got snow cover. And so people in Ottawa are meant to believe that the planet is heating disastrously, and for some reason it's snowing anyway. And at some point, they it simply is going to dawn on them that what they were told was going to happen is not going to happen. And the sad part is that it's, you know, it's Mother Nature that's going to win the argument, not us who are hammering away at it. But I think we are making progress. And in fact, my prediction here, and these things are nonlinear, so it's you know, worth what you paid for it, um, is that this particular panic is actually past its sell date and is going to fall apart fairly soon. And something else will come along. That's the problem. So we, we you know we'll just move on to the next battle, but that's that's what life is like. But it has it has run its course, and the combination of climate policy producing real misery. You know, energy poverty is a fancy, long-winded way of saying that people are going to be cold and hungry and they're going to die, uh, as is going to happen in Europe this winter. There are going to be a lot of premature deaths because of this policy. And it's not true that the Europe is turning into the Sahara Desert. And you, you put these two things together. What you did say would happen didn't. And what you didn't say would happen did. You promised us this green economy with new and better jobs and prosperity for all. And instead, we're switching back on the coal plants and shivering because we can't pay the power bill. That that hits ordinary people. Um in a way that intellectuals, I mean, there's a great line from Orwell about how you'd have to be an intellectual to believe such a thing. No ordinary person could be such a fool. But it, in the end, the populace has gone along with it because it was easier than not going along with it. And it didn't seem to matter. To, oh, yeah, sure. Climate change. Great, man. Uh, but now the power bills are soaring and the snow is falling. And so I actually think that we are a lot closer to winning this argument than it might sometimes feel as though we are, which doesn't mean we should slack off right we should redouble our efforts and put an end to this so that the next foolishness has a, a clear field of fire but i i'm actually you know i always say i'm not optimistic that's a psychological condition that's generally fatuous but i am hopeful theological virtue uh, i believe that truth will prevail i think the universe is so constructed that ultimately truth will prevail and uh, in that spirit i shall at least be found stretched out next to it if that's uh, what it comes to
the late Tim Ball, I think, said that he had lived through four different uh, kind of scares, warming, cooling. But uh, do you think that people alive today are going to witness a global cooling scare? Kind of seems like we I are. think it's possible. Yeah. And, and the worst part is this one might be true. Again, if the Holocene really is cycling down, the next downturn could be the last one. And, and one of the reasons for being concerned is that the Little Ice Age, as far as we can tell, was the coldest period since the last retreat of the glaciers. The, the cold periods keep getting colder. And if, again, we've got a new Stripes graphic, and we're actually going to have it on our merch. We finally got a merchandise store as well, uh, which shows not the last 150 years, but the last 500,000 years. And when you look at that, most of the time it's deep blue. And then there are these thin bands of red. And the one we're in now, the Holocene is actually just orange. It's not as red as the previous Emian interglacial. So uh, I think we might be faced with that. But I mean, I too have been going to die for a number of reasons. And I believed some of them. I was quite concerned about the Club of Rome and its resource depletion. I was certain there would be a lethal nuclear war. Um, and frankly, if we are going to get done in, we might well do it to ourselves. But I, I have seen that there's a certain mentality that is convinced that if humans do not change their ways, some cosmic disaster will occur and that they must save the human race from itself. And, you know, I, I don't think it's hugely helpful when people call climate change a religion, especially if they mean, therefore, it means you have no brain. But there is a powerful human impulse from whatever source to repent and mend our ways or else we shall attract divine wrath. And when you cease to believe that this refers to your own personal behavior and the seven deadly sins, it doesn't go away. It just looks for something else. Um, and so, again, these people who said Ronald Reagan was a threat to peace, on the face of it, when you looked at Leon Brezhnev and Ronald Reagan, this was it was hard to credit that anyone would say that. But it was this impulse that we must be somehow at fault, that the things that are wrong in the world that was a classic. Somebody did a way back a century or so ago, they wrote to a number of leading people and said, what's wrong with the world? And G.K. Chesterton wrote back and said, I am. But again, he, he was a Catholic and a very, very serious theologian. So he he took it on himself. I am my sins are why the world isn't perfect. But if you get the sense that somebody's got to repent and you don't think it's you, then it lends itself to things like climate alarmism or the peace movement that go around with this sort of fixed smile while spewing venom at people. Uh, and again, one of the things about climate alarmism that I would urge people who are not committed on either side to look at is who are the ones who are talking nastily? Who are the ones who are actually intolerant of dissent or even questioning? I mean, that lovely line from Richard Feynman about I would rather have uh, questions that can't be answered than answers that can't be questioned. Um, which side takes that view? Because by and large, if you're really interested in truth, you want to be with the people who are willing to listen, uh, not the ones who are quick to strike. I'm curious what you think about if climate hysteria does die, you said, uh, then the next thing will come up. What, what will the UN focus on next? Any, any ideas if they can't focus on climate? Well, it, it's it's hard to say. Again, you, you get this sort of feeling of, a, of an increasing, a, you know, the sort of Jethro Tull, the train that won't slow down because when the first real radicalism in the modern era had this idea that what was holding people back was was outdated feudal laws and if they just had economic freedom they'd be fine and so and they've largely won that battle the john stuart mills of this world you really got a laissez-faire world and we got a lot richer but but people were still sort of unhappy something was still wrong so then it moved into this idea of the progressives, the New Deal. The problem is we don't have economic security. And so they thought if we just give people free money, then they'll finally be happy. And they managed to do that on a, on a very large scale, but people were still kind of disgruntled. So then they, they thought, well, maybe, and, and they hit on racial bigotry, and this was a terrible thing. And so it was great that the civil rights movement came along and they really did achieve a great deal, but then people still seemed kind of unhappy. And then they thought, well, we need to give them social security. It's revealing that the American program is not called economic, but social security, that you're going to, everybody's going to belong. The great society would, would include people. And so there's huge push in that direction and people were still unhappy. And then you got this thing with gender, where if only we had 63 genders or something along those lines, or, you know, it started out just if we could have casual sex back in the seventies, and then it got more and more radical, but I don't know what's left after that. I mean, when, once you've decided that you can just change from a man to a woman or back inside your own head, it's hard to think of a new and more radical approach to human liberation. So maybe we need to go back to the, uh, the old idea that we should repent of our sins and ask for God's forgiveness. Um, 
But again, I, I didn't see this one coming, so why would I see the next one coming? It was bad enough that communism was popular. I mean, incredible the extent to which in the 30s and even into the 40s, North American elites thought Stalinism was a very plausible alternative to freedom and human rights. Um, so so something foolish is bound to come along. Um, may, maybe some new religion that uh, takes a very, very harsh view of infidels or... Uh, but as I, as I say, you know, submission unto the uh, day is the evil thereof. Let's let's get this one uh, in its grave, and then we'll uh, we'll see what comes staggering across the horizon, moaning for our brains. What else would you like to cover? Any other points you'd like to make? There's one more point that I think is very important, and it is that when you raise questions about climate science, you will often be told, "Well, you can't talk about this because you're not a climate scientist." And this is uh, a view that I think is very it's hypocritical and it's hypocritical in two ways. The first of these is that if someone's on the right side in the debate, if they're Greta Thunberg or someone like that, or Al Gore, nobody raises the question of credentials. And then if you come up for the other side, even if you have, in my case, I think very relevant training, but it's in, in studying the past and I have good mathematical instincts, um, then they start doing this credentialist thing. But the other reason that I think it's absolutely a uh, dirty pool is that the alarms go around saying, vote on climate change, support politicians who will do something about climate change. You, the citizen, must take a stand on climate change. And then when you, the citizen, take a stand and say, well, I think you're wrong, they say, huh, how dare you speak, peasant? And I think that people should insist on their right as a, a, the fundamental idea of self-government is that the average person's common sense is sufficient to unravel the big questions. I mean, nobody goes around saying, well, you can't vote on the budget because you're not an accountant or, you know, you can't have an opinion on defense or foreign policy because you're not a general or a diplomat. Uh, at least very few people do, and they generally don't say it out loud. And so I think that we, one of the messages that we really try and convey at the Climate Discussion Nexus and, and give people the tools to act it out is to say, you're an engaged citizen. The wisdom of crowds is what drives democratic self-government and always has. It is how we have determined whether or not to confront tyrants. It is how we've decided what to do with social programs. And we've we've often gotten it wrong. We're not perfect. But we make better mistakes than an isolated elite that is not challenged. So when people say you don't have a right to an opinion, you're just a citizen, you say, yeah, I'm a free thinking citizen in a self-governing community. And that gives me the right to an opinion on all the public policy issues. I have a duty to be informed and I should try and mind my manners, but never let them tell you the experts have settled this one and you just need to do what you're told. That is no way to set policy when it comes to an epidemic. It is no way to set policy when it comes to housing or urban development or anything. And it's no way to set policy on climate. So I, at one point I quote William Pitt, the elder saying that, uh, Whenever his liberty or his property are in question, he trusts the dictates of common sense because he has seen experts time and again, not just mislead others, but mislead themselves. And that's not to disparage being an informed person. Obviously, you should definitely, you know, follow Tom and watch our videos and all these kinds of things and all the Tony Heller and, and Andy Watts and so on. Study the matter. Think about both sides. But at the end of it, don't let anybody shut you up with a piece of paper. And I will. Uh, one time I was on the State Department tour of swing states and we were getting briefings from all manner of liberals. And at one point, um, there was somebody who was, was going on about economic policy, and I, I took issue with him. <laughs> and she looked at me and she said, well, I have a PhD from Harvard, so I don't think you should have an opinion. And I responded, well, I've got a PhD in history from the University of Texas, so we got a kind of credential standoff, and we're going to have to debate the issue on its merits. And you should just insist I have a right to debate the issue on its merits and not to be insulted, not to have my character or my motives impugned. I am going to vote. I'm going to be an informed citizen. I'm going to debate. And uh, I have every the right and the duty to do that. And just don't let them shut you up. Don't lose your cool. Don't start swearing. On our, on our social media, we have a rule against vulgarity. We don't even allow acronyms. And people are sometimes puzzled by that. But we say, no, you, if you think it's baloney, call it baloney. There's lots of good words. Be witty, be intelligent, be thoughtful, be courteous, but do not be silenced. And so that's my final thought on this is, inform yourself and speak up because the truth will prevail and that's the side you want to be on okay very very well said I, i'm impressed by uh, your your ability to speak so uh, <laughs> uh thank you very much for doing this
Well, thanks so much for having me on. And I hope everyone will check out the newsletters and the videos and uh, become a more informed and che more cheerful participant in the debate. Sounds very good. Thank you. Thank you.